Are you happy you came to church today? Yes. Amen. I'm very proud of you because the devil tried to keep you from coming here. He hates it when his children, when people come and seek the Lord. We've been looking at Christ on how Christ is sufficient for us. We looked at that last week. That Christ has to be sufficient for us. Christ is the only reason why we come to church. Christ should be the only reason why we come to church. It should be to spend time with Jesus and no one else. It is also a time when we see our friends and family, and that's wonderful, and there's, and there, there's a time for that during fellowship meal and, and time. But our primary reason should be only to spend time primarily with Jesus Christ and His Word and His Word. And only He is sufficient for us. We looked at also, uh, Pastor Austin talked before that about the two women in Revelation. And the two brides and, and how we want to marry the bride of Christ. We, we want Jesus to be the groom. And choosing between those two women. We looked at the mark of the beast and just what that actually is. The mark of the beast. So it's really easy. You got to figure out who the beast is. Once you figure out who the beast is, then you figure out what their mark is, or their mark of identity is. And we've, we've seen that in previous sermons as well. But this, this morning, what I, wanna, what I would like to share with you it takes us to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. And you see the Bible tells us and shares with us that Satan traps us in four different ways. Satan traps his people in four different ways. He traps us not in this specific order, but he traps us um, with bad health. With, with bad health. You see, when you are sick, you don't feel like being a Christian. When you are sick, you just want to get well. And sometimes the devil does anything so that we are not just sick physically, but mentally as well. And he traps us because everything that we put into our mind, into, I'm, I'm sorry, into our mouth, affects us mentally. So he can get us sick as well. And use that as a trap, as an attack, in coming between my Lord, my Savior, and me. Satan uses relationships as a trap as well for us. You see, people will get you headed toward the wrong direction. And unfortunately, sometimes people keep people out of church. And they are a test of your Christian growth. That's why last Sabbath I mentioned that is Christ sufficient for you? Are you coming for Jesus Christ? Are you coming to please someone or, for, or, or looking for someone? Or looking for the favor of someone? Even if somebody were to slap you in the face, would you still come in through those doors? If Christ is sufficient, you're coming only for Jesus Christ. And the devil will use relationships sometimes as a trap to keep us away from him, from, from God. The devil also uses immorality, and I'm not just talking about the wrong type of sex, but not wanting to do right is also immorality. You don't feel like being nice, you don't feel like saying thank you, or you don't feel like saying I am sorry is immoral. It's immorality, and the, the, the devil uses that as well. But the one that I want to talk this morning about is the devil uses materialism. The devil uses materialism as a trap for you and for me. So let's bow our heads before we begin. Father in heaven, I ask that your Holy Spirit may abide here. And in the name of Jesus, I cast away any fallen demon angel that wants to take away our attention from your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 13. We're focusing specifically today on verse 17, where no one will be able to buy or sell. 
But just as the review, as the review of Revelation 7, uh, Revelation 13, we've seen that there are two beasts there, and there is something going on historically, something going on historically. Whether it's this beast in Revelation 13, or the beast in Daniel 7, or the dragon in Daniel 12, all of them are after God's people. Every single one are persecuting the saints of the Most High. Every single one is after God's people. And this is why I'm so glad that you're here today because the devil hates that you made it to church today. The Bible says that the devil goes out and makes war with the saints. War. Only those who have been in real combat war know what war is really about. And the devil doesn't care about anything else but making war with you against God. Not to come to church. And here in, Re in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, it says, And all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Here this beast power divides the world in two groups. Those who worship him, those who worship the beast, and those who don't. It's narrowing it down. It's narrowing it down. There is not going to be an almost Christian person. There is not going to be an almost decide to follow Jesus person. This beast power is going to narrow it down here where it says, And all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Or those whose names have been written in the book of life. There's going to be two groups, the lost and the saved. Those who worship the beast and those who worship Jesus Christ. Last night, last night there was a, a Vespers at the King Spanish Church. And Pastor Gary Blanchard was having the, the message. And how an appropriate message. Him talking also on Revelation 13 with the beast. But he took the analogy of beauty and the beast, which we are all familiar with. And he said, we need to worship the beauty and not the beast. Jesus is beautiful, friends. Beautiful as, 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 as our creator, as our redeemer. The most beautiful person that there is. And that, that stuck to me. And, and he emphasized that worshiping the beauty and not the beast. And so here in Revelation 13, we see that this first beast is going to divide the world and those who worship him or those who worship God whose names are written in the book of life. And we see also in verses 11 through 16, this second beast. And just this, this, this is all just a review. The second beast is also influenced by the devil. And we know that because it says that it will speak like a dragon there in verse 11. The second beast will speak like a dragon. He goes so far to force the citizens to worship the first beast. The first beast. So the second beast is going to bring religious intolerance. You see it there in verse 12. Revelation 13, verse 12. And he exercises, talking about this second beast, the second power, he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He causes. He doesn't ask you. He doesn't plead to you. No. He forces you. He brings a system of false worship. His method is force. And you see, this is contrary, total contrary to God. Because look at Revelation 22. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. Does God force anyone to worship Him? Is anyone here because you are forced to be here? Revelation 22, verse 17. The Bible here says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts, Come. And whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Freely. Jesus is saying, come. He, inv he invites you to come to him. Come to me. 
While in Revelation 13, this power, this kingdom causes, it forces. But yet Jesus says, comes. He never forces. That's why we read in Joshua 24 where Joshua says, Choose you this day who you will serve. It's your choice. He's, he's, God appeals to you. In 1 Kings 18, 21, Elijah is appealing to the people where he says, How long will you alter between two opinions? Elijah is wanting the people to make up their mind and choose. And he says, If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is your God, then follow him. But stop trying to follow both. Stop trying to follow both. And one of my favorite is Exodus 32, verse 26. Exodus 32 is a chapter of the golden calf where Moses is in the mountain with God and Israel is down in the bottom. And Israel turns to worshiping an idol led by Aaron, Aaron uh, Moses' brother, who was influenced by the peer pressure of the people. Don't miss that also, church. Pure pressure can have you do the wrong thing and pure pressure can get you lost. And so here Aaron gave in to pure pressure. And so Moses comes down, we, we've read the story, we've seen the Ten Commandments, he comes down, he is, he is mad, he destroys the Ten Commandments, but then notice verse 26. God never forces, He always invites. Exodus 32 verse 26, one of my favorite verses there. Moses is standing, stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, let him come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together. That's interesting. The Levites were the priests. They were the first ones to make that right direction to Moses. Because Moses was serious and he knew that God was serious and God was about to do something. And when you read the rest of the chapter, God did do something. Everybody else who wasn't, got eliminated. God said, destroy them. And, but God appeals. Can you imagine after not seeing Moses for 40 days and thinking that maybe he had died in the mountain and you were out there celebrating with a false worship and in the back of your mind you knew you knew that it was wrong and yet they're still there celebrating and dancing and the Bible says they were naked and then you see Moses the one who you thought was a lost goner and he is upset and he knows the sins of the people and, he, and when he claims and says if you're on the Lord's side come to me would you be going straight to Moses at that time? I know I would. I would, be, I would be making a beeline right to Moses. Even if I had been doing wrong, I knew that Moses was with God. And God here appeals and says, come to me. If you're on my side, come to me. You see, that's the kind of God that we serve. We can spit in the face of God. Or we can say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, and follow him and follow him. So here in Revelation 13, verse 16 and 17, going back to Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 and 17, this second power, this second beast, which we've already re reviewed and identified, it says, And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, that's everybody, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here the devil is using materialism to give in to the false power. To give in to him. To give in to a false worship. The first beast, as we've already identified, is the Roman Catholic Church papacy. And the second beast is the United States of America. If you have a doubt of that, I, I, I invite you to listen to previous sermons where we've identified that from Scripture. But if you, if you still don't believe that, that's fine. That's not my problem. But just know one thing. Just know one thing. That in the last days, there's going to be someone that is going to make you do something 
that you don't want to do. There's going to be someone that's going to make you worship whether you want to or not. That is clear here from the Bible. That he causes all those who dwell on the earth to worship the first beast. He causes everyone to worship it. And it goes so far that if you do not worship, he makes sure that you are not able to buy or sell. There it is. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has a mark or the name of the beast. See, now how is this possible? How, how can the devil pull this off that we don't worship God because of buying or selling? You see, the answer is found if you turn with me to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. The devil knows how much we love to buy and sell. More to buy. James chapter 5. How is this possible? James chapter 5 verse 1, it says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl at your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures in the last days. When? In the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, you underpaid, cried out, and the cities of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have mur murdered the just. He does not resist you. How is it that the devil gets us in buying and selling? You see, when the stock market went belly up several years ago, people were crying. And some even committed suicide because of the money they lost. So, you see, and some of those rich investors and bankers lost thousands, if not millions of dollars. You see, for me, if somebody, you know, for me to lose a million dollars is nothing because I've never seen a million dollars. <laughs> I get upset if I just lose fifty dollars. But here, their security is in the money. Their, their, their security is in material thing in materialism that's what it says here come now you rich weep and howl for your miseries have come upon you and they have laid up these treasures in the last days their security was in their money see money earned in a corrupt way and they were piling it up here it says in verse 3 in the last days they were piling up their money to depend on their money, to depend on their investments, to depend on their stocks, to depend on their retirement. But you see, Jesus has a better plan. See, Jesus has a better plan. And he, says, he tells us, don't get tied up with your riches. On the contrary, Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and all these things shall be added to you. All these things, in the context of that chapter, Jesus guarantees our clothing, our food, our necessities. He will provide for us. Now, I'm not saying don't be smart and don't save anything. What I'm saying is don't go to bed counting on your money to be your rescue. Don't go to bed counting on your retirement or your, your portfolio to be your rescue in the last days. Because while you're sleeping... Inflation is happening and what you thought was worth $50,000 may not be worth $50,000 anymore. And then when, it, when it's not, then what? What are you going to turn to? The Bible is explaining why the devil will be able to use financial pressure. 
See, there is a corrupt system that is making finances so important and then deceives you and I to rely on those finances. When the day comes to pressure you or to pressure me, the devil knows that we rely on our, on our money, on our CDs in the bank, on our stocks, on our retirement. And here James 5, 1 through 3 reminds us Re reminds us that our dependence should not be on these things. Just verse 1. Come now, you rich. And then what are the next three words? Weep and howl. Weep and howl isn't so much of a joyful experience. Weep and howl for your miseries that, you, that are coming upon you. Weeping and howling. This country's financial situation is not going to get any better, friends. It's not. We live in a world where people like to use other people. And in this world, you will never get paid for what you're worth. How many of you have ever been underpaid? <laughs> you're never going to get paid what you're worth. But church, heaven has paid what you're worth. The blood of Jesus Christ who died on Mount Calvary paid it all for you. If you're wondering how much you're worth, you are worth more than all the money and gold that exists even in this earth. You are worth the life of God Himself. He died on Calvary just for you. He didn't ask you whether you were good or you were bad or you follow Him. Whether you choose to follow Him or not choose to follow Him, for, for God, you are worth His life. You are worth everything to Him. And He paid it all for you. You see, sin brought material insecurity to the human race. When, 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 when we sinned, we brought material insecurity. If you remember when Adam and Eve sinned, they lost their home, didn't they? They were taken out of the Garden of Eden. They became homeless. Cain, the first, the first child as well, was taken out from his home after he had sinned, after he had slain his brother. The Bible says that he was cast away. In James 5, there in verse 7 and 8, the Bible tells us, after the Bible warns us of all these riches that people depend on and luxury, there, verse 7 says, Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the, of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain? You also be patient. Establish your hearts. Establish your hearts on what? What do you think? On what? On... No, nobody knows what to establish your hearts, what to establish your life on. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Establish your hearts on God. Make God your priority. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Is at hand. When God, when God called Abraham, if, if you look there in Genesis chapter 12. You see, Abraham was a rich man. Before and after. Before God called him and even after God called him. Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 through 4. When God called Abraham the father of the faithful. God required that Abraham detach himself from material stuff. As part of the covenant of faith. There Genesis 12 verses 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Get out of your country from your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him and Abraham was 70 five years old when he departed from Haran. How old was he? 75. 
Does it matter how old you are to give it all to God and surrender and follow Him? God says, come and follow me. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter how young you are. And here God called Abraham to detach himself, to leave his home, leave his father. And yet God blessed him. God blessed him. And God blessed Abraham by returning his riches that he had. But Abraham wasn't following God because of the riches. Absolutely not. You see, after Abraham followed the children of Israel in the wilderness. And when you read the story there of the children of Israel in the, in the wilderness, they faced with material insecurity. They were faced with material insecurity. Everything that they had depended on God. Depended on God as part of their faith relationship with God. They had to do without in order to build a relationship with God. You see, who provided water for them? It was God. Who provided the clothes for them? And the shoes for them. The Bible says that their clothes and their shoes did not wear out. Did not wear out. I mean, this suit is already wearing out. I'm not going to show you, but there, there, there's, there's a place in my pants that needs to be taken to Dorcas to help me sew that piece. <laughs> our clothes wear out, our shoes wear out, but in the children of Israel, during all those years, their clothes or their shoes never wore out or even faded the color. So who provided the clothes for them? God did. The shoes for them. Who provided the food for them? God. Even when they were stubborn and wanted their meat, God says, here. God provided everything for them. Who provided the cool shade in the hot desert? God did. Who provided the light at night and also serving as a heat in the cold winter nights there in the desert? God did. Who provided the directions in which way they should even go? God did. They followed the pillar wherever they... If the pillar stopped, they stopped and camped out. Until God said, it's time to move and the pillar started moving. You put your stuff on your backpack and you follow the cloud. You followed Moses which was being led by the cloud. God always deals with spiritual infidelity by snatching material security. God always deals with spiritual infidelity by snatching away our material security because He wants us to be dependent on Him alone. Now, don't misunderstand me. I, I, I do need to say this. God is not saying that we be irresponsible. Part of the fourth commandment, part of the fourth commandment that calls us to rest is called us to work. Does, does, does it not? Exodus 20. Six days you shall work. So God wants us to work, to do something. God isn't calling us to be irresponsible and not be workers. No, no, no. He calls us to work, to be responsible, but not to be dependent and rely on what we work and what we do. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6 through 8 tells us, learn from the ant how it gathers in the summer to use in the winter. Learn from the ant. So God wants us to be responsible, but the problem is when we rely on those things to be our rescue in the time of trouble. That's the problem. See, God is saying, you're not going to worship me and rely on your stocks and bank accounts to pull you through the time of trouble. You can't. If you're going to worship me during the time of trouble, you're going to rely on me. Because Jesus says that we will run to the rocks and to the mountains. And in the rocks and in the mountains, friends, what are you going to have? Nothing. You're only going to have God to rely on. You're not going to take anything with you. No one cares in the caves or in the mountains what fancy dress you're wearing or what expensive suit I have or how much money I had in my account or my retirement. When I'm out there being persecuted during the time of trouble, our only dependence is going to be on God. Our only dependence must be on God. Our financial system 
in this country is crumbling at our feet. And somehow our citizens here are looking for some kind of presidential messiah to fix it. And that's not going to happen. James, James chapter 5 reminds us it's not going to happen. All of your worth and gold and treasures are going to just be crumbled at the end. So I just want to appeal to you, if you turn with me to, to the book of Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah chapter 33. During the time of trouble that it is told not to buy or sell, we need to rely solely on God. Isaiah chapter 33. Verses 10. Here the Bible says, Isaiah 33 verse 10, Now I will rise, says the Lord. Now I will be exalted. Now I lift, now I will lift myself up. You shall conceive chav. You shall bring forth stubble your, your breath as fire shall devour you, and the people shall be like the, burning, the burnings of lime. Like horns cut off, they shall be burned in the fire. Hear you who are after off. No, hear you who are afar off. What I have done, and you who are near, acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearless has Fear, fear, fearfulness has seized the hypocrites who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire. Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? He who walks righteously and speaks upright, uprightly, he who despises the grain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shut his eyes from seeing evil. He will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. What's going to be our place of defense and, and fortress? Rocks. Bread will be given him. His water will be sure. Our bread and our water will be given to us and will be sure for us, friends. For us. I have a quote that I'd like for us to look at now. Here from Earlier Writings, page 56. Earlier Writings, page 56. It, the Lord has shown me repeatedly. Repeatedly. That means we're not getting it. The Lord has shown me repeatedly that it is contrary to the Bible to make any provision for our temporal wants in the time of trouble. I saw that if the saints, who are the saints? That's us, amen. You should say we are the saints. I saw that if we, the saints, had food laid up by them, up, the, I'm sorry, I saw if the saints had food laid up by them or in the fields in the time of trouble when swords, famines, and pestilence are in the land, it would be taken from them by violent hands and strangers would reap their fields. Friends, you don't think that, I mean, we have such a powerful military. Amen. It, it can benefit us as a country. You don't think that when, that when that military turns against Seventh-day Adventists, it will be a piece of cake to find them? Of course it will. That's why our dependence, it is contrary to the Bible to make any provision, any provision, not just food, but even money. What good is money going to do you when you're out running for your life and hiding? Then, she continues saying, then it will be the time for us to trust holy in God and he will sustain us and listen to this friends I saw that our bread and water will be sure at that time 
You see, she's not just saying, she's not just quoting scripture, which, which she also is, quoting from Isaiah. But God took her in a vision and she saw us being provided by God in the wilderness. I saw that our bread and water will be sure. Not might be sure, will be sure. A pastor once said, all you got to take with you is a cup and some butter. <laughs> it will be sure at that time. And that we shall not lack or suffer hunger. Amen. How many like to eat? <laughs> Every one of us like to eat, friends. We will not suffer hunger. Now, and now. <laughs> we will not suffer hunger. It doesn't mean gluttony. Hunger. There's a big difference. We shall not suffer, we shall not lack or suffer hunger, for God is able to spread a table for us in the wilderness. If necessary, He would send ravens to feed us as He did feed Elijah. Or even rain manna from heaven as He did for the Israelites. Friends, do you have anything to worry? Praise the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 6, friends. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. God will provide our needs. So when they were to come and say, no buy, no sell, we will say no problem. Amen. My God is my fortress and my king, my provider. He will provide my needs. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, our scripture reading, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moss nor rust destroys and where the thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, friends. Is our, is our treasure in our financial mountains that we have laid up maybe in our banks, whether it's here in the United States or you may have a, a bank account somewhere else, in another country, thinking it's going to be safer because it's not here. God says, wherever your heart is, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And I appeal and plead that your treasure and your heart are in the right place. That they may be grounded in God. So even though, even though that they may say you cannot buy or sell, that's okay because my God can rain the food down for me. My God can set a table before me where I will not suffer hunger or, or will even provide the necessities that I need. Whether it's clothing, whether it's heat, whether it's cool. Do not think, friends, do not think that, it, that God only provided that for Israel out in the wilderness. He can provide the exact same thing for us. Same thing for us. So no buy or no sell for us, it's no problem. It's no problem. God will provide your needs, friends. And do you believe that? Yes. If you believe that, friends, then you will be able to say, if you really believe that, and I believe that you believe that, you will be able to say, be still my soul. The Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In everything change, in every change, he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways lead to a joyful end. To a joyful end. God is our refuge. God is our strength. 
comes time for no buying and no selling, that's no problem for me. God provides for me now and He wants us to be responsible, but He does not want us to rely and count on that at the end. We need to solely rely on our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Father in heaven, Lord God, we know that there will come a time where we will not be able to buy or sell. But Lord, that is fine because you will provide what we need. But I want to thank you so that way it is not caught by surprise for us. You have given us the warning and what to look out for so when it does come, we will not be surprised, but on the contrary, we will be even more happy because we know that you are just around the corner and coming very soon. So Father in heaven, may we look forward to the day that we can buy or sell. May we look forward to seeing how you will provide. May we look forward to that soon coming day when you will come and blow that trumpet. Thank you, Father. And meanwhile, Help us to prepare our hearts every day to depend on you. That our soul may be still because our confidence is in you. Thank you, my God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.